Hey guys, this is Brett Young, Taylor Young, and Rod Erb, and you're tuned in to the Be Extraordinary Podcast with Urban Young. Real conversations about business, leadership, and personal development. Hey guys, welcome to episode 10. Um, super pumped, man, that we're going to uh, do something different today. Um, last uh series or podcast number nine, episode number nine, we talked about creating a platform for growth. And specifically, um, and in that podcast, we talked about creating a systematic approach to creating an environment where team members and people in an organization have an opportunity to plug into something and grow personally and grow professionally. Um, one of those tools that we have been, that's been near and dear to our hearts that we've utilized for the last 10 plus years is a personal development call. Um, and we talk about that in the last episode, um, the why behind the what, why it's been important, what it's all about, um, the hows. Um, but we thought it might be cool to actually play a call and maybe fill in some of the gaps and the details as to how that stuff works. Um, so this week, we're going to do that. Um, it's the first time we've ever done that, first time we've ever done that externally. Um, and hopefully that, you know, give some value to some people that are listening out there and under, ask themselves, you know, what what is this personal development call? How do you guys do this? How does it work? Um, and no better way to do that than to actually just play a call. So this week, uh, we pulled one that uh, Tori Scarborough, one of the up-and-coming leaders inside the organization, led. Uh, he did a great job, and he just led a fantastic, uh, really easy-to-listen-to conversation about one of the chapters in the last book that we read, which was called Atomic Habits. Awesome book. I'd highly recommend it uh, if you haven't uh, read the book. Um, very, very good. So very applicable to any industry and transferable to any uh, job position or or any um, uh, any position within an organization. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll get into it and uh, hope you guys enjoy. All right. One minute to nine here, guys. We have Tori, Amanda, Sam, Danielle, Matt, Emmer, Rod and Carson, Eric, Heather, Jessica, Taylor, Chris, TC, Hama, and Large Rob. Who are we missing? All right. Well, it's 9 o'clock, so we'll just get started here. Um, we'll start off with those three pillars um, before I introduce who our speaker is tonight. Um, the first one showing up, which we all just did, activity, which we're going to be doing during this entire call, and personal development. So I'd like to start it off with uh, Tori to lead the call tonight. Thank you, AP. I appreciate you doing this, girl. Um, what's up, everybody? Uh, I'm leading the call tonight. I wanted to do it. I asked Brett if I could take it from whoever it was supposed to be last week because um, I definitely dig the book. But also, I think uh, usually I like to – I find myself – finding I find myself motivated to step up in certain times when there's a lot of uncertainty or when there's things that um, are going on where everybody's kind of pulled in different directions like this past week obviously we know what we've been going through and things have been busy I know this week has already been busy after a long holiday so I wanted to I wanted to jump in whenever I could and I felt like now was the time and I'm so glad that it was these chapters because especially chapter two chapter three as well um, how habits shape your identity and how to build better habits. Um, I really resonated with personally, just in my own uh, personal and professional life, but um, I want to hear everybody's thoughts. But what I wanted to start with for tonight was something that I've read through multiple books and I've heard multiple times in different ways, but it all comes back to the same idea and it's intrinsic motivation. And for those of you who don't know what it is, I mean, if you haven't read about it, it's, it's what I've found to be probably the most powerful motivator of all you know nobody is pushing you to to do something nobody is you know ridiculing or prodding you there's nothing external that can make you do it it's it's coming from within coming from your center it's, it's creating and i guess you could say it's creating an emotional connection to a physical action you know looking to the internal for an external response um we usually will talk about it in goal you know goal setting as you know, starting with your why for those of you who have done goals and, and achieved goals, um, you know, in this iteration, he talks about who do you want to be, but we'll get to that. I mean, it's all about getting to your center. You know, the strongest part of the apple is always the core. You know, the fruit is, is what you is what you can eat on the outside. You ever watch somebody eat an apple and they throw it away, they never eat the core. The core is always still standing there. And I, I wanted to get to the center of what he's talking about tonight, and he's talking about the identity of who you are and who you may be right now and who you want to become. 
And he goes through the three layers of the behavior change, which we've all read. He talks about the onion, right? And I, I was trying to break that down to myself and how I could discuss it in a different way than what you guys have all read and how it re- resonated with me. But I think of the three layers, and I thought of it differently. I thought about when we're doing goals, you know, what is the outcome you want? He talks about going from the outward in is what most people do on the onion. You know, what do you want your outcome to be? You know, what is my outcome? And then two, what am I going to do to get it? And then three, usually in a goal setting is why do I want it? But which one do you think is the most powerful? Spoiler alert, I'm sure you know it's three. Why? You know, start with your why. And even James Clear, he begins the book, you know, at the very beginning by starting with who he was and who he wanted to be and who he, who he became and why he changed it. Um, all that stuff is, is what most people go through. You know, I think all of us, no one can say they don't go through, okay, I'm, I'm not reaching this goal. Why is that? Well, I'm not, I haven't gone deep enough and identified with why I want it. And he just says it in a roundabout way. But I think that's really what he's, you know, you can read it in every personal development book. You can read it in any book that goes over this, these types of themes. And the problem is always we can't change it, right? What's, the problem isn't that we can't dream for what we want. We can't, you know, we can't come up with goals. That's not the problem. The problem is we can't achieve the goals. We can't change it which is why he talks about you first have to change or identify who you want to be. And for those of you, I don't know if anybody's really read this. Um, I don't even know if Brett remembers this, but he, when I first started, or maybe a couple of years in, Brett was reading a book, and I saw it on his desk. It was a very thin book, and I, I went home, and I tried to remember what it was, and I ordered it, and it was by a psychologist named H.H. H., 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 excuse me, Maslow, and it's called The Theory of, Motiv- of Human Motivation. And he was a psychologist um, back in the 1940s and the 50s. And his theory was the hierarchy of needs, which if you ever want to look it up, it's it's a small uh, but tedious read. Uh, so just know that going in. But what he talks about the basic human needs and why we need them. And one of the ones he discusses is self-actualization. And the best way I could probably describe it, for those of you who don't want to dive into that book, is he sums it up in a quote, what a man can be, he must be. So even for you women, I apologize. You can substitute it there. But that's that's the overall overarching idea. I mean, so, for example, a musician, he makes music. An artist must paint. You know, a writer must write, which all seems pretty self-explanatory, seems pretty harmless. But we make these titles based on our own self-image. And if you, when I'm pairing that book with this book, they're saying the same thing in different ways. And obviously James makes it a little more, um, he, I don't want to say he dumbs it down, but he makes it a little more modern. But if you flip that and don't make it so harmless, flip it to a negative self-image and what we're trying to get at. You know, so if you, for example, I'm a smoker, I must smoke. You know, or I'm a, I'm a heavy drinker, so I must drink. I'm an oversleeper, so I must sleep in in the morning. You know, if you, if you change it to a negative self-image, which is why most of us don't reach that goal, it's all about identifying and, and relating to who you want to be and how you can achieve it. But if you think you are that, you're, you're going to do everything you can to make that happen, which is what he's getting at. So change that identity. And whatever you identify with yourself at your core, think back to the apple, you will do everything you can to become that. So I think when I'm reading this chapter and what I want to pose to you guys, for those of you who may not have thought this way, is how do I harness that in a positive way as opposed to a negative way? You know, how do I do more things that serve me? Well, I have to get closer to the center of what I want to do, and and then you'll find those things and start doing those. So I love the second chapter, and I want to open it up to you guys, and I want to hear your thoughts, but I do want to pose a question to everybody. So when you hear all this, I found myself thinking that way of reading this chapter and thinking, man, do I have a habit that I do due to a positive or a negative identity that I have of myself? You know, so for example, I'll take in a very harmless way just to start. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm a good time. I feel like I want to be the guy that everybody wants to be around. So that's how I identify with. My habit is that I commit to going out with everybody or I want to, I want to be that person. So I feel like that's what I have to do. So Obviously, if anybody has anything, any thoughts on Chapter 2, I definitely want you to, to verbalize those. But if, you ha- if you're struggling to find something to say on these calls, I'll pose a question to you. Have you ever found yourself in a habit due to a positive or a negative identity? We can start there, and I'll let everyone kind of um, kind of hear their thoughts. Go 
story. This is Taylor, man. Um, on the identity piece, I think we've had these conversations privately, but uh, I also find myself um, reflecting after hanging out with different friends groups, uh, not negative or positive, but I was going to a birthday party just last or a couple of days ago, um, and it was with some college friends, and uh, I couldn't help but think of my identity with that group of friends and how different it is uh, with some other group of friends and how much that's changed and how much I've changed and the circumstances have changed. So not good, bad, or indifferent, but I'd find myself in certain situations with certain behaviors um, that just didn't feel like me anymore. And I think it was that clinging to an old identity where you fall into that habitual behavior. So I can totally relate to that and specifically to what you're talking about. Um, and I guess in reflection, just really being aware to make sure that, you know, behaviors or habits are intentional rather than just something that was once was. So I just wanted to share that. No, I appreciate that, man. I I, I think we all do. I mean, I, get, I actually listen to you. I'm thinking, damn, I actually probably do the same thing. Kind of what I was referring to an example is you, you feel like you have to be, this person or you identify that you are this person and you kind of pigeonhole yourself into this role and then you you, you subconsciously act on that role. I mean, we're, you'll get to the neuroscience in Chapter 3, which is amazing in itself, but I know TC will love that. But I, I agree with you, in cer- especially in social circles, 100%. That's probably a whole chapter you could do on that, but I appreciate the thoughts. Anyone else? Hey, it's Danielle. I just want to speak up because – you, you both have mentioned the word identity, and when I, like, first started reading this part of the chapter where it talks about the outcome, the process, the identity, it talks about the layers and, you know, that you really need that identity to make these habits, and that it always reminds me, of, like, of what Brett says about Urban Young and that in the end, no matter what you do, if you show up and you act like you're doing something every day, in the end, you're going to be seen as to who you really are and what you can really, you know, do you believe in the process? And it, it's so funny to me because that's what this is. That's what this is talking about. If you don't believe in it with you, that your identity, if you're just going to, it's not going to work. So I just really like that part. No, absolutely. I mean, it's, isn't it? I mean, I think of like you girls too. Like I think of how I was, you know, you kind of like going back to say with social circles, you know, if you, if you take the, what he Satan says, I, wrote, I underlined in the book. He said, you know, the, the more pride you have in a particular aspect of your identity, the more motivated you will be to maintain the habits associated with it. You know, so if you enjoy being a part of, you know, a team or, or a group, whether it be Urban Young or whoever, you will do everything you can to keep that identity or to, keep, to live up to the identity you think that you have because you take pride in it. Um, I, I, I resonate with that too, Daniel. Brett, um, what a great question. Um, I I guarantee you every single person on this call is racking their brain through their Rolodex of their thoughts, um, some of which are probably way too intimate to share on this call. So, number one, thank you for asking a really good question. That's the only way you get really good answers. Um, And I'll be vulnerable here for a second because... I think sometimes people think they have it all together and, and they are, the question of identity is a universal one and it never ends. It's a, it's a, it's an internal battle. I think that's just part of breathing, which is, which is kind of a fun, fun deal, fun challenge. But, um, you know, for me personally, Tori, you know, I have, I have a, I, this old identity that I've had as being the person that's kind of by themselves back against the wall Nobody believes in them, uh, me versus the world, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, that's, that is an identity that I'm having to, I've had to realize that that doesn't have to be the case anymore, but yet I struggle because that's an identity that I'm proud of because that's kind of a big part of my journey and my story. So I like to look back on that and and I'm proud of the fact that, 
people said that I couldn't do something or that it was stupid or I'm wasting my time and it were it, it, it's just blossoming into something beautiful. So I'm very proud of that identity, but it's very destructive. And I find myself, I find myself creating this energy from when things are, things get tough and it's not good for my marriage. It's not good for my relationships. And, and where I used to draw power from that identity, I've now realized that that's not, it doesn't have to be who I am anymore, but I still hold on to that. So being vulnerable to your question, Tori, you're not alone. That's a, that's a very universal question. Everybody battles with something on which they were or they are or they wish they weren't or they wish they were. And having just awareness to that is a, is a cool is a cool conversation. So what an awesome question, and I, 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 I genuinely appreciate you bringing up something that is probably one of the most fundamental questions anybody could ever ask themselves when, when, when looking to make any type of change in their life. So I, I can totally relate. Yeah, no question, man. I always appreciate your vulnerability. What I was thinking when you were saying that, as I was thinking, man, is, is that not growth? though too like even like understanding that growth is not just you went from a lower place to a higher place you know growth is also that i don't i don't i understand the issues with who i was or who i wanted to be before it's just different now i just have had more experience i've kind of pivoted that you don't regret that identity you had but you understand where the pitfalls came from and then you changed or you you re-identified although you still might have that in there i mean that to me is growth would you not agree and it's never a, a finished deal. And I would argue that part of your identity from 20, 15, 10, 5 years ago, no matter how much you've unidentified with it, that's a constant um, reinforcement that needs to happen there in order to, to, to replace it with the identity that you want. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that, too. I think it's tough. I mean, I think the book asks a lot of tough questions, kind of going back to what you said, and I, and I appreciate that, too. I mean, it, if you're not asking yourself tough questions when you read a book like this, it reminds me of The Slight Edge. For those of you um, – we've all read The Slight Edge. I'm, I'm sorry. For those of you who resonated with The Slight Edge, which I hope everybody, for the most part, did, you know, if you don't ask yourself tough questions – I cried the first time I read The Slight Edge. Like, it it, asks, it forces you to ask yourself tough questions, and I think this book's kind of getting there as well. He's, he's laying the foundation for, you know, what are you going to ask yourself? He talks about he's going to tell you how to do it, but you have to actually do it. You know, you have to do the work. He can only give you the blueprint. Um, so I, I, I love everybody who does the calls from here on out to ask tough questions on this book. I think we're at a point as a group where – you know, whether we don't respond to them or not, I don't want to get, get vulnerable. I think it's a good point where, hey, listen, it's time to start asking ourselves some tough questions when we read these books or we're not going to get a lot out of it. So I appreciate you recognizing that. Um, anyone else? I don't want to step on anybody's toes if you have something out there. Matt here. Um, just listen to you guys. Tori, you, you cried during the slight edge because you identify yourself as a crier, bro. That's why. No, uh, I'll joke and say, Brett, Brett I, I like your comments. Um, I know you're a guy that, yeah, especially Taylor, you, uh, you two are obviously brothers. You like to carry that chip on your shoulder, give you that edge to, to, to push you. Um, and just being vulnerable myself, <clears throat> for those of you that don't know, um, I started smoking cigarettes when I was like 15 years old. And I finally was able to quit when I was 23. Um, but for the people that I've known and spoke to anybody that's ever quit something like smoking or drinking or whether it's drugs or anything that really has a hold of you, um, you, you there's not too many successful stories that it's not, they, they weren't able to quit that unless they went cold turkey. I mean, you don't, you, I don't really hear many people that just say they slowly weaned off of that stuff and a lot of that has to do with your identity you know you wake up one day um to where you mentioned growth there you you finally get to that level of growth or whatever you want to call it to to finally pull the plug on whatever that is and you identify yourself as somebody who is done smoking somebody who's done drinking um 
and it's just I just think it's so powerful because most people say it's it's really hard to do, um, and so they couldn't they couldn't do cold turkey. But that's I, you know looking back, it's like you know you're just you're you're being soft and you can't you're you're not ready to identify yourself as a non-smoker or non-drinker. Um, you just have, you finally have to have that level of, of growth or, or confidence to do it. And I just think most people are you know, successful when they, when they finally go cold Turkey and they finally identify themselves as something else. So just want to share my thoughts. Yeah, I appreciate it, Matt. I don't think most people know that you smoke, but you, you got over it. I mean, I know it's, it's tough, man. But what was he talking about? That's why I love this book, you guys. He just speaks so affirmatively, and he doesn't flower the text. He just, you know, you have the power to change your beliefs about yourself. Your identity is not set in stone. You have a choice in every moment. He's very poignant with what he says. And um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to go on. If somebody else was talking, I apologize. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, buddy. Hey guys, Eric. Um, kind of picking back on Matt there. I mean. Um, I wasn't a smoker, but I can, I can only imagine the, that difficulty. And, um, but you talk about growth, you know, you, you get through something like that and you conquer it. I mean, your, your self-confidence and your, your belief and, and how you can overcome things as to just go, you know, through the roof. And then you have other people be like, Oh, you just quit smoking. How'd you do it? I've never been able to. And it kind of, you know, Taylor and Chris and I were kind of talking about that a little bit this morning too. It's kind of like when, when you achieve something potentially that, that someone else may not have, and they say, Oh, I haven't been able to quit. I can't do it. It kind of, you know, it it doesn't sound arrogant or, you know, egotistic, but you're kind of like, it gives you more confidence, more belief that, Hey, I, you know, I quit smoking when, you know, um, I know it's very difficult to do. I mean, I can do anything. Um, but, kind of relating this to the book or a, a part in the book that kind of identifies with that, I think is, um, has a little section that says the goal is not to read a book. The goal is to become a reader. The goal is not to run a marathon. The goal is to become a runner. So I, I think smoking is a great example of just, you know, like I, I'm going to quit. It's your level of belief. These people say they couldn't do it. They didn't, they didn't believe strong enough or they didn't tell themselves from the start. Like I, I am done. Like, you know, I think it just, it comes back to your core, you know, core of the apple, it just comes to your core. Like what, what do you want? What do you believe? And then, okay, this is my identity. Now, how, what am I going to do to achieve that? You know, what am I going to do to change my habits to replace smoking with something else until I can completely block it out of my brain? So, you know, I think our brains are (laughs) insanely powerful and, um, I think you can almost start anything by just with belief and starting with your, with your brain power and, and see where it takes you. Yeah, I appreciate that, Eric. And you're actually leading us right into chapter three. I mean, talking about, you know, the, the, the cue, the craving, the response, but one thing that you said there um, when you were talking about chapter two is, you know, the habits fundamentally, they're not about having something. It's not about having read a book. You know, it's about becoming someone, it's about becoming a reader. So, I love that, man. That was great thoughts. And and you led us right into Chapter 3. I mean, the, the Chapter 3, I can imagine for some, you know, the when you're getting into the neuroscience of it, for some it's not their flavor. <laughs> I know some on the skull where it's just not their flavor. But it dives into the very same neuroscience of behavior or brain hacking as a book we did for the personal development call. It's called The Power of Habit. And for those of you who've never read that, it, it, man, I'm sure he's going to get into the exact same type of, uh, you know, cue, craving, response, reward, which I can't do it any better than he could in this chapter. But if you, if you ever want to read a book like that, it's, it's a read, but it's it, it's it's amazing. It's it's amazing to learn about how your brain works and trying to, I don't want to say, I hate to say brain hack, but hacking it so that you can change your behavior. It's all about the behavior change. Um, I mean, because what he talks about habits don't restrict freedom, they create it. I was not a fan of being a, a habitual person. Like my father is super OCD. He's very anal about how he wants things to be in his, you know, in, in his, on his vanity, how he wants to, where he puts his wallet, with his keys, how he does things, how he does his work. And it, never, it clashed with us growing up. But as you get older, you kind of, and read books like this especially, you learn to respect those types of things. 
What they see says in the chapter three, when you have your habits dialed in and the basics of life are handled, your mind is free to focus on new challenges and master that next set of problems. And believe me, everyone on this call has done that. You know, if you're starting a job, if you're starting, you know, start, Urban Young moves into Melbourne, Tori moves into Urban Young, to speak personally, you're starting a job, you don't know your ass from your elbow, you have to learn new things, but you want to be better, right? You identify with a person who can be better. And I, this is just as I do, just as, you know, the girls do, just as Brett Tay and Rod do, and they started an insurance agency, everybody, it goes for everything. You identify, I can get it done, I want to be better, and you figure it out. And now, how many of you out there started your gig, don't know, didn't know anything or didn't know something about something, and now you know that, and now you've moved on to the next problem. Okay, next problem. I remember Rob wanted to get me putting RCEs in the emails with the TDOC email, right? And I always forgot the RCE, and Rob always got on my ass about that damn RCE, and I would forget it because it was more of a job for him to go get it when he's trying to go to the next one. It's not his deal. It was my responsibility. I identify with a guy that wanted to, you know, uh, help somebody out and not be that guy that dropped the ball, and I started making sure the RCE was first. Everybody's done something of that nature. If you take Michael Jordan in The Last Dance, for those of you who um, hopefully have watched that documentary, B.J. Armstrong talks about it. I'm going to go to sports for a second, like my boy T.Y. B.J. Armstrong is a point guard and says, it got to a point where Michael Jordan was so good, he had everything dialed in with basketball, he was no longer playing basketball. He was letting them play until Michael needed to come in. And usually it was to close. You know, he identified as a closer. He figured out everything, he dialed his habits in for how he had to attack what he wanted to be, and then he, he did it. Next problem. That's what they talked about, the feedback loops. You know, and you'll, again, go to The Power of Habit if you guys want to pick up a book, read that book, if you want to kind of companion this. It's all about problems and solutions. Because we are naturally, we're natural problem solvers as, as a species. We'll find a way to solve it. Talks about the last dance. just depends how bad the headache is. How bad do you, how, how do you identify with it? And how, what are you going to do to get there? And, and I, I love that part about the psychological side of behavior, you know, by examining what your problem is and why you need to solve it, the how is there. You'll figure it out. But once you have, to, you have to identify with where you feel, and I say problem, but you understand what I mean, identify where you want the change in your behavior. I mean, I would love that if I had time, I hope I do, I would love to ask one of the 75 hard guys. You know, he talks about, you know, how do you make it obvious? How do you make it attractive? How do you make it easy? How do you make it satisfying? For those of you guys doing 75 hard, maybe one of you guys quickly. I mean, how did you guys make that obvious? You know, going back to what he's talking about, how did you make it attractive? Because you guys have been 30, almost 40 days in. You know, if anyone of you guys can quickly just say, you know, how did you guys follow this? Or do you find yourself that you followed this when you were starting the 75 hard and trying to get into it? I'll speak, uh, Tori, for, for Pinky and I. Um, just kind of become a game. And so it's it's kind of become fun to kind of check off the things you have to do during the day. So um, we've done that walk consistently in the morning, so it immediately activates the endorse, endorphins uh, that you got to win, like early, early on. And then I've also started to, at times, get my 10 pages even before that walk. So we've been waking up early and uh, just, just making it more fun that, you know, it's kind of like this 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 game that you're able to check off that you did it. You check off and then you get to the end of each day, and all of a sudden you wake up and you're almost on your 40th day. So we've been having way more fun than than when we thought we started it. It hasn't been miserable because I think because of that, like you mentioned, make, making it you know a reward. How did you make it like attractive to to get up and do those things or to or satisfying maybe? I mean, do you find yourself, if you read this chapter, do you find that, oh, my gosh, this is actually kind of what we did, you know, in our, in our heads to get there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so. I think attractive is just to, uh, like like what Eric said, it's just, I don't know, I tend to burn on the fact of I know it's hard. And so as it progresses, it makes me feel proud of myself that I'm doing something hard and that in itself is attractive because I'm separating myself in my own mind from, from uh, you know, during the challenge. So every day, every time I get a walk or a workout, I feel really good, and it is 
So I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's kind of my draw to it is is kind of just one more step in the right direction to be able to check off. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I, I commend everybody doing it. I mean, Chris, I know Chris. I mean, Chris, you were the kind of the first guy I knew who was doing it. Maybe you and Eric with with Tay. And I mean, do, do you find that? Do you read the chapter at all and kind of say, "Oh man, I I do." Like, what do you do in your head to kind of keep yourself going and keep the habit up? Because uh, I don't I don't want to let myself down. I don't want to let my teammates down. Uh, selfishly, I guess. Uh, but I mean, at the at the same time, like it's become a habit and and that's obviously what we're reading, you know, it's about. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's less thinking about it because we're so far into it that this is basically a practice. So um, I know we're running out of time, so I wanted to answer that shortly and quickly, but that's the best way and a concise way to, to answer that. You know, George, can, I, can I expand right. upon that, man? What's funny, what Chris just said, we realized this the last couple of days, it truly has become a habit. I am physically exhausted tonight, and sometimes I have higher energy levels than not. But I'm amazed that you look back at the day and you go, wow, we had a full work day. We woke up at 530. We each got two workouts in, and we read 10. You know what I mean? Like you just look at that, and you don't even realize that you're doing all of this stuff. And when Chris just said that, I shared that. And so it's just super encouraging for anybody that is in the early parts of a habit or kind of debating a good habit they may want to start. I've been pretty amazed by the level of how clockwork some of this stuff um, has been for, for us after, after, you know, 38 days. Absolutely, man. If you want something different, what do they say? If you lay the same bricks, you're going to build the same house. And if you keep doing, you get what you repeat, as he's already told us. And I, I appreciate everybody's thoughts. I'm sorry if I didn't get to you. I'm, 30 minutes is short when you digging the book but i'm gonna leave you guys with this um my final thought was you, know, you talked about your habits are shaped by the systems in your life which i would like to say is your identity but we know that your systems are designed by what you want or who you want to be in life so what i was thinking as i was trying to figure out what to close it was to restructure our systems you have to ask yourself who do you want to be and try we say be the man you want to be who is that? or be the woman i'm sorry ladies who is that and I want you to identify it, and I want us to go become it. You guys have a great night. I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me lead. Good job, Tori. Great job, dude. Good job, Tori. Yeah, buddy. All right. Well, there you have it, episode 10. Uh, great job, Tori. You did a fantastic job on that, as always. Um, just enjoy listening uh, to progression and people stepping up the plate and taking ownership and leadership. So uh, thank you for stopping by, guys. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe. And uh, just as importantly, if you found this podcast informative, if you found it uh, entertaining, engaging, and you feel like it would help somebody, please share uh, the podcast. We appreciate that. Um, as you go about your day, uh, one last thing I wanted to tell you, we have a really cool episode coming up in the next couple of weeks about risk. Um, we get to talk a little bit of shop and we get to talk a little bit about uh, navigating risk through not only this landscape, but also just uh, the general business landscape. So as you go about your week, as you go about your day, uh, remember life is meant to be extraordinary. So we appreciate you guys. Take care.